All right, my friends, welcome to episode 292 of Prof and Dev Play Games. This is the episode where I tell you I've lost six months of my salary on Dogecoin. Uh, I'm just kidding. Did not do that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, no, it was, all, it was only like three months. <laughs> yes, exactly. It was only three months. Uh, my name is Larry, the professor at Prof Plays Games on Twitter. Over there is Anthony, the dev at Summer Speak. How is your, how's your time? How's your weekend? Uh, it was great. Um family was gone from thursday uh, until back today which is sunday um i worked thursday and friday so not as exciting i still had a bunch of bunch of shit to do um but the nights were full of me playing a lot of mass effect so awesome. uh, we'll get to that later and we can talk all about uh my experience finishing mass effect one again and i think this is the third time i finished mass effect one um and then into my uh continuation in the mass effect 2 um, awesome because it doesn't stop it just keeps going it just keeps rolling they're all they're yep. all in there they're all in there <laughs> um so yeah we're gonna talk about that in the back half of the episode uh we're gonna start uh, with this uh, article by cat bailey it's kind of almost a long form article special report the inside story of blizzard's departures and a company at a crossroads by um cat bailey on ign i think i mentioned that um it was published on the 21st so two days ago um before we dig in kind of piece by piece, what were the overall, like, I don't know, the big pieces you walked away with from this article? Hey, this reminds me of what it look work, uh, feels like to work for a big uh, capitalistic corporation who yeah. cares about money and continued growth. Always continued growth. Um, and boy, does that suck when you're in a place that doesn't, hasn't truly cared about that, uh, at least on a top top line like most important thing for most of your career um it hits close to home in a number of ways <laughs> um, yeah, yeah when i was as i was reading this i was like D -d -d are there parallels here to pop cap when it yeah started i mean it's it, then... it's not even pop it's a lot of companies to be honest yeah. it's all these giant publishers i mean i will say activision blizzard uh ea what are the other big push ubisoft um Maybe Microsoft buying studios? Microsoft, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Microsoft goes back and forth. Um, but mm -hmm. yes, Microsoft, they do care about a bottom line. Um, it, it, it just has parallels to all of it, of being, look at, there's this company who makes really good products, One of the but one of the things that they do is like they've been successful, so they don't sit there and worry about the money as much. They're just like, we release things, we're going to release it, we're going to create what we want to create. It takes time. Uh, that usually doesn't f fly too well in uh, companies more focused on bottom lines and revenue targets, quarterly targets, yearly targets. Um, th there's usually uh, bashing of heads eventually there, and that's what it sounds like with Blizzard. Even though Blizzard has been, let's be honest here, and this article is like, Oh, it's Activision Blizzard doing this. I'm like, Blizzard has been like owned by other companies since the 90s. Like, they have not been an independent studio for their actual successful time period ever. Who were they owned by before Activision? Vivendi. Oh, that's and right. And they were owned by Vivendi before. Like, and it was through a bunch of acquisitions that they eventually ended up at Vivendi. But uh, I have to look again because um, I looked this up because I was cu curious on like their trajectory of, well, how did they get bought and where'd they go? Um, and Activision merged with the Vindy games back in the day, not Blizzard. This Blizzard was the only important thing or well-known piece to Vivendi right. games. Um, I'm trying to see. They were founded in 91 to 94. They got bought uh, by... In 1994, they were acquired by distributor Davidson and Associates. And then that company got acquired by Sierra Online. Um, and that eventually got um, merged into another thing and then eventually sold to Vivendi. Mm. Like in 98. 1998. Yeah. Havis. Sierra Online, which included Blizzard, to French publisher Havis. The same year, Havis was purchased by Vivendi. So through like four or five different acquisitions, Blizzard ended up at Vivendi, owned by Vivendi. Right. And then eventually Vivendi spun off their games division and s sold that to Activision back in 2008. But so 
Blizzard has never actually been an independent company um, beyond the first three years that they existed, and that was not uh, that was prior to them making the original uh, Warcraft. Is that during the time period when they made Rock and Roll Racing? Yep. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's just like yeah, they were. I didn't. Are they still Blizzard then, or were they Synapse and Silicone? Silicone and Synapse was their first name. Yeah. And they published a couple games under that. Oh, uh, yeah. No, that was Rock and Roll Racing and Lost Vikings were pre-name change, company name change. So they were Silicon Synapse then? Yes. Uh-huh. And they cho- they changed to Blizzard Entertainment in May of 1994. Mm. So they released a number of games for three years under this other name and then were acquired and changed names. Um. So we should all look at Blizzard in some way of being like, they have never been in full control of their destiny. <laughs> They've always had someone above them uh, in some weird way. Sometimes people that had no clue what video making video games was and probably treated them much more standoffish in that way of being like, you make money. We'll give you money. And you just make money. Cool. We're done. We're right, not exactly. going to, it's very hands off hands off because it's just a black box. We don't understand, but it makes us money. So, We'll leave it. So be. keep doing it. <laughs> it's kind of like cool. how Hasbro treats Wizards of the Coast and Magic uh-huh. and D and D. They're yeah. like, we give you money, you do stuff with that money, and then you give us profit out the other side. Cool, you do cool, things we don't cool. understand. Just keep doing it. Yeah, pretty much. Um, at least for a long time, that's what uh, how Wizards operated, and I think they still do to some some degree. Um, well, I, I can imagine during the, the World of Warcraft heyday, it was like, yep, just do your thing. You're making money. I mean, that's Vivendi was only and was just like, yeah, go to town. Um, mm-hmm. Merger with Activision in 2008. So that was when WoW was still on its big upswing. Because I think WoW peaked in 2012-ish at like 12 million subscribers, which is insane. Um, but yeah. So... Article, yes, there are parallels to companies being acquired by, um, I would say, publicly held or uh, executive companies that really care about games and are very hands-on in their management about games. Yeah, it's really, the the thing that stands out to me, like, that totally makes sense. Um, On the other side, not just the money side, but just, like, the family side, and I'm talking about how it just felt like a family Yep. And then you just keep getting emails where people that you know are leaving. Yep. And then eventually you just feel, I don't know if you feel alone or feel adrift in some way, but a lot of these people who are leaving are, are fi- founding yeah. studios that are tiny again, where they're trying to recapture, almost like they're trying to recapture that feeling, you know? Yeah. I mean, and the people that are leaving and forming these have all the, uh, I think it mentions here, one, they have a bunch of money themselves to start a company. And that venture capital is huge right now. So right, uh, yep. they have the name power to say like, yeah, I was a founder or very long time employee of Blizzard through its heyday. Please give me money to start something new. And honestly, they're probably excited to start something new. There's a point in time uh, when you see these people leaving like that. Um, and over time with that, I would say pressure to make money or change things especially these people like um kaplan and morhaim and metzen and all of them mm-hmm. they weren't doing this for the money right, right to begin with like sure they made a bunch of money and they're very well off one i've i met morhaim and i talked probably chatted to morhaim for probably about 20 minutes at a bar at blizzcon and just gushed about the stuff he did but then him talking about PopCap, and it was great and but i truly get the sense that he was like he just enjoyed games and making games he wants to make high quality games he cares about that and mets in the same way like they cared about the craft of making the game because they also believed in the thing of you polish and make a great game that you're proud of it will do well right um but that kind of butts up against the the thing of, well, how are you going to make money off this? And I think the first time you kind of start seeing that fracture is actually Diablo three. Yeah. The original Diablo three, whenever they're like, well, we have to have an auction. We have to have some way that Diablo three, which is a pay once game. Yep. How can it have a, a long tail like world of Warcraft? And that's after Activision by Activision merges with them and Activision blizzard is created. 
And there's that pressure of being like, well, all your games have to be as big as World of Warcraft now. Right. So show us, show us the money. Show us how it's worth doing. And they choose to do an auction house in Diablo 3, which is a very poor choice, honestly. Yep. Um, but I don't think that was something internally Blizzard was like, oh, we have to do this. It was mostly pressure from above and executives and saying, no, you need to make that money. Yeah, because in terms of like talking to shareholders and whatever else, that quarterly report, like, uh, you know, user engagement, I think it mentions later in the article, yep. monthly active users or whatever. Like, how do yep. you, you have people coming in for Diablo 3, which is a game that's come out what, 11 years after Diablo 2. Um, we're getting them in the door once a decade. That's not going to work. We want people coming in the door every month. Um, yep. And it's a chain. It's a, it, and that's the thing about it. It's, and it's not like Diablo 3 wasn't going to make money off of just straight up box copy sales. Right. It's this mindset of, well, it's going to make money, but doesn't make enough money. Um, there's always more to be made. And I actually think that I felt that way a certain amount of, at PopCap, there were decisions that eventually got made that was like, well, we have this game that's making a, a small amount of money. It is profitable, good couple million dollars profitable a year, but we really just don't even want to put the money towards that. What if we put the, our money towards something else that has the chance of making 10 times that? We'd do that instead. Wow. And that was just yeah. a considerate thing. It's like, yeah, yeah, and that happened many a times of, of uh, the mindset of, yeah, we know it's pro this little thing's this profitable. It's not enough, though. We need bigger. Um, and I think Blizzard is in that with how big WoW was, and they had to be. The expectation is you deliver something of that revenue amount. Um, right. And this article gets like, this is really, to me, reading this article is like, of course all the higher-ups are leaving at this point. Like, they feel constrained on what they can make. They're going well, to smaller teams so they can actually make the things that they want to make because but, there's no way that happens in this giant corporate environment. And I imagine consistently being told to tell the teams below you who are pitching things to you, no, we're not going to greenlight those things. That must wear on you after a while when you think. Yeah. When you look at those projects and thinking, there's like some really good fun here and some merit to these projects, but you're not going to make Bobby Kotick's salary. So you yeah. have to say no. Yeah. I think that eats at you. And then as once the dam starts to break, that's where you start seeing that getting an email a day of people that, as you said, that family leaving because mm -hmm. it starts and it doesn't stop. And I know that feeling quite well. Um, and it definitely hampers morale overall. Um, they keep on talking. They need a win. And it's like, it's going to be a while. I think, Diablo 2 Resurrected is probably going to be at least your um, a, a kind of win. At least maybe flatten that that leaving curve a little bit. But you got to follow it, it up like... with something. You need, like, Overwatch 2 has to be big. Um, Diablo 4 yeah. has to be big. But they don't... Blizzard doesn't release games that often. That's just not what they do. Right. Um, that's not how they've ever made games. Like, four or five years between games is not unimaginable. Um, I feel like Diablo 2 Resurrected as a win is similar to Mass Effect Legendary Edition as a win for Bioware. It's not, I mean, I think obviously there's more work. I don't, I don't mean it like more work as in <clears throat> they did more work, but I mean like it's a remake, not a remaster yeah. um, in some ways. So obviously it's, it almost feels like a whole new product, but I feel like Bioware has gotten a bit of a lift from having this yeah. amazing thing come out, but it's, it's an amazing thing that came out a decade ago and it's just that thing again. And we're excited about it. So it, it's temporary lift, but then you're moving into like, what's that, that next thing really has to hit. And I yeah. just don't know. I don't know. I know there's been some consternation in the community about overwatch two because they've reduced it from six to five players per team. And the, you know, the pro players, you know, they are <laughs> yeah. six players to a team. Now they're like, wait, what? We're, we're losing one support or uh, one, I think it was a tank character. Um, there's, you know, uh, some visible yeah. consternation with their, with Blizzard's audience, with Diablo Immortal, with this decision. 
obviously with the, the auction house Diablo three, yeah. like, there's just so many dings to the reputation that I don't know how high Diablo two resurrected gets them, even though I'm yeah. desperately. I don't think I don't think it gets it that high. I think it just it changes the narrative a little bit, at least for a time period. Um Yeah, for sure. I always mm-hmm. I always think of it as uh the thing is when companies get this way, they especially internally you get into like what I call negative morality and like morality debt. And one thing that this does is it helps stabilize the morality back kind of at the company into like neutral territory that ideally you can change the narrative internally even to be like, get it more excited. Like, look at, we got an, we, we can still put something out there that people want and like, right. Right. um, now look ahead to what we're making. Now let's do that again. Um, I wonder, I wonder if that's dampened in some way, um, as the article mentions, uh, Diablo two resurrect was pushed back. It's supposed to come out last June, uh, because kind of like what happened with war master or not war master, uh, reforged, yeah. um, Warcraft reforged. And I wonder if, because they've had to fold in vicarious visions and they came in and kind of did some heavy lifting on that game. Does that like put a ding in your morale that someone else had to come in and kind of help carry that forward? Or you just all feel like the same team? Depends. I don't know. Yeah. I can't speak to internal uh, feelings there, honestly. But I'm sure it depends on the person you talk to overall, um, which employee is looking at it and their own their own takes on things like that. Um, yeah. Like PopCap was the the Garden Warfare thing. Um, mm-hmm. and what became Bla- uh, Black Box Interactive became uh, PopCap Vancouver or whatever. Um, right. Burnaby or whatever got rebranded to. Um, I, I think if you talk to anyone at PopCap, you'd have different opinions on if uh, if that is treated as a win for PopCap as a whole or right. uh, another company using the IP. It I don't know. It it depends and it depends on the person and it becomes pretty personal, I think, in a lot of ways on that. Um, so in one part of the multiverse, I'm right. In one part, I'm wrong. I can do it. I can deal with that. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, people's moral morale at a company is is a very personal in a lot of ways um oh yeah but uh, i think it is really hard for people who work at blizzard who just don't release games that often um and when you're in a place where wow has been trending down like the cash cow is i believe just above two million active subscribers now which final fantasy 14 has more active subscribers now damn wow okay Final Fantasy fourteen has two and a quarter million subscribers, mm-hmm. and WoW is now below that. Like Final Fantasy fourteen is on an upward trajectory. It's taken a long time, but it is definitely on a slow burn upward trajectory. And WoW has been just shedding players over the years. Like, yep. it, and you can you have to imagine it. You, there's no way WoW stays as big as twelve million subscribers for thirteen years. Um, right. When that no. peak was reached, I think it was two thousand eight. Actually, it was uh, Wrath of the Lich King was was when it hit. Um, yeah, 2008. So that's when it hit 13, uh, 12 million, just over 12 million subscribers. And that carried Blizzard for a long time. Right. Um, but it slowly declines. It, 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 and I get that, that probably from an executive level, they're looking like, well, what do you fill that with? They were like, why isn't it staying at 12 million subscribers? And it's just, that's unsustainable people churn out of our MMOs. Like I stopped in 2010 and not playing anymore. And it's not because I dislike the game, just my life changed and I can't play it anymore. So. Well, it's not really, it's not exactly a game that like our generation, right. Grew up with it and played it. I don't know if it's a game that appeals to like, I don't know, like 15 year olds now. Yeah. I mean, well, you, you look at like the stuff that people, yeah, 15-year-olds and stuff are playing, and, like, the games that are online games that are the most popular worldwide aren't necessarily MMOs anymore. You got League, uh, Dota 2, like, those games dominate online play now. Um, oh, but if you think about the uh, Activision Blizzard portfolio, it's called, it's it's Warzone now, really. Oh, yeah, but and, yeah, Call you have Call of Duty, which we can talk about that, too, whenever, I think the article mentions is, like, uh Blizzard doesn't make a majority of the money for Activision Blizzard. Like, I, I found stats on this. Uh, net net revenues generated by Blizzard Entertainment from 2007 to 2020 
Let's just go to 2020. Blizzard Entertainment themselves made 1.9. Uh, is that net revenue in millions of dollars? 1.9 billion dollars. Pretty good, right? Just Blizzard. I, just I the Blizzard. 1.9 so, billion. Yeah. Activision Blizzard's net revenue for that same year, eight billion. Right. So the Activision side brought in uh, f- four times more yep. than the Blizzard side. And well, and the article mentions they call the shots then. They do. And yep. they 100% call the shots because they're the one who's providing the continued growth for the company. Um, right. And sustained year over year. And that shows also from Activision Blizzard making, I think as of last month, every studio owned by Activision side of this works on Call of Duty now. Yep, that's what that was the report last month. They do nothing else but Call of Duty. Yep. Which is insane. But when it's making six billion dollars a year, um uh, I definitely see why you would tell have some investors would be like, why do you have anyone working on anything else? Right. You want to maximize our profits, yeah. please. Because we are in <laughs> late stage capitalism and uh growth is all that matters anymore. Yeah, late stage capitalism, man, is fucking everything up, including yeah, kind of, <laughs> it kind of is. Um, uh, you should always sustain growth, and everything should stay as popular as it was always. Do you want go 10x ahead, go every year. Yep, Christ, like it's just un like if you're making the same amount of revenue, right? You're making yep. or profit, I should say, profit. I'm making two billion dollars of profit a year. Yes, but you're not growing that profit, so then the stock price isn't going up. It's just staying the same. Yeah, but you're still making $2 billion. It doesn't matter. I need more. I'm like, fuck, man. How many Lambos yeah. can you buy? Uh, and that That is exactly... When I look at all this and read that article, that's what it basically comes down to of being like, yeah, Blizzard is successful, but they are not growing Activision Blizzard's share price right, right. now. Yes, exactly. And they could fact, sustain... Codex, like, they're to take a fucking pay cut. Yeah, well, they could sustain all they want. Like, the thing is, is that Blizzard could just be like, if there wasn't pressure from the top, they'd be like, yeah, this is how much money we make. We can we can function like this for as long as we see uh, in the future. But that's not good enough. Right. And when that's not good enough, that's when you start seeing these longtime people there basically get out and be like, I'm sick and tired of this. <laughs> like, why do I want to put up with this? Um, and so th- th- they leave, uh, and then you get a bunch of other people left there trying to honestly salvage it in a lot of ways um it's not that only one person makes a game but those figureheads are important they dictate culture and tone and provide that guidance towards teams like making a game especially even blizzard games actually i would say blizzard is different in the fact that they usually keep their teams much smaller than other AAA studios um they always have Mm-hmm. Um, they're not like Ubisoft thousand person teams working on an Assassin's Creed. Like we're talking sub two hundred people working on a game at Blizzard. Um, and they're I usually know for on a long campus, right? Yeah, like they're teams. They are active right. teams that work in the same area together. Um, and the thing is, is you while one person isn't making the game, a strong essentially captain for the team is important to keep everyone aligned towards the same goal. I also feel like they're like a shield from protecting them from the top, you know? Yep. Yep. They tank, they tank, uh, corporate interest. They can usually a good person like this can, can manage up and down equally well. Um, and so as people like that leave, it demoralizes the team below them. And usually the people they get put into the position, that they left are somewhat dictated about by those executives above them, which probably doesn't have the team's best, best interests at hearts all the time. Right. Um, exactly. I am pretty cynical about this. So <laughs> I, I, I like to think of it as realistic, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get it. Um, so I, I, I don't I, know. I, sorry, go ahead. Go, you go. I was going to say, I appreciate this long form article from IGN. Like, I don't, I don't feel like I see this as much, um, from IGN, um, no. and I, this was just 
I don't know because Blizzard's near and dear to my help, my heart. I just I read this with such sadness, um, and also knowing someone who works there. Um, yeah, kind of having some sense of this, anyways. Um, yeah, dude. Like I just just one of my favorite developers, and to think about. I think about like my teams and who I work with and and like I'm a leader on my teams and what that means for those teams. And then if I were to leave, then that culture changes. And if a culture changes in a way that's not ideal for the people who are left, like they would either follow or they would leave themselves. You know, it's just yeah. kind of like you said, when the dam bursts, it just explodes. And that's just it's sad. It does. Um, and we'll be curious. I think they have here. What Overwatch two is? Is it this year? They thought into this year, or is it twenty twenty two? Twenty twenty three. Um, I thought the analysts said it was going to be twenty twenty three because they're, yeah, uh, could be as late as twenty twenty three before Blizzard releases Overwatch two, but it's at least twenty twenty two. They said yesterday, or they said yeah. at the live stream this week. Okay, and then Diablo four is roughly around the same time. Like it just right, happens so to be that nothing way. till then, right? You know. And yeah, and I get this is also brought up here. They have a profit sharing kind of thing going on. And I'm right. sure that profit sharing was amazing when WoW was at its peak. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, for a long time. And that's the thing though, is I bet WoW cha- really messed with people's perceptions on how that thing works. Um, but now that that's kind of mellowed out into what it is, uh, they had misses with... Um, their MOBA, Heroes of the Storm, right? Like it never caught on. Like it just, I don't think it ever did. It was did poorly, but it never caught on the way that uh, Dota Two or League did. Um, yeah. I would, so that one call that a miss. I think Hearthstone generally has been is down a bit. Like it peaked really high, and it's now kind of fallen to a very common sustain area it's with a slow decline which is expected spikes and expansions and then slow decline um yep so it just feels like as a company any kind of revenues are for profit sharing are pretty stable right now it's like that's what it's going to be and that's what's going to be until 2023 i mean i guess we might get a spike for diablo 2 um resurrected but in general you got some time before another game so uh you shouldn't be anyone there that came there who's betting on profit sharing is probably out as well. They're just like, no, nah, it's not worth waiting two years to get there. Right. Um, Especially at they least can find two years, more, I should say. Um, that would make them happier in the meantime or more lucrative. Yeah. Um, or you see your friends going and starting, you know, um, was it Moonhaven or whatever it was called? Oh, there's a whole uh, bunch of them. Um, yeah. Just trying to see what Dreamhaven, Dreamhaven, Dreamhaven. That's more uh, Lightforge games, Secret mm-hmm. Door, Frost um, Giant, Second Diner. Yeah, Frost Giant. There's Metzen doing his tabletop thing, mm-hmm. um, which just did a pretty uh, successful Kickstarter. Um, I don't remember what I get, but his yeah, said one his, million in eleven or one million right now, and is funded in eleven minutes. Yeah. So, and that's the thing with Metzen. He's uh, well, this is the thing. He's well off enough that he can easily make uh, a functional tabletop role playing thing, which is uh, pennies compared to the video game market um, right. sales wise. But he can put the money into it and then really sustain himself quite well for a long time. If that's his his dream now, is just being like, hey, I just really want to make <laughs> like tabletop stuff and. Um, and tell my own stories again there. Um, yeah, War Chief Gaming. That's right. That's the name. So, which is pretty cool. But all these big people left and just want to do their own thing again. Um, see if they can they can make a uh, lightning strike again. Yeah, I feel like if you have, all, you know, all, like Morham, for example, like all the money in the world or whatever, um, if that's the case, then go do something you love, you know? Yeah. So... so. Oh man, yeah. they've got 1.2 million of um, 50,000 that they're looking for. <laughs> yeah, I thought about cool. backing. I'll probably just buy the book when it comes out. But yeah, it looks cool. I like Metzen's art and everything. So um, April 20th to May 24th. Oh, this just ended. Yeah, it just ended. I think the book will probably be out next year sometime. Wow, that's so cool. Um, 
So yeah, no, I mean, I think I think there's a good chance that a lot of these people will be successful. But you also have to think now if any of these uh, offshoots are successful, they will just hire more and pick up more Blizzard family that they want to work with again. Um, so I have a feeling that the Blizzard of the future is gonna just gonna be made of it's gonna be different people than the Blizzard to now. Yeah, and the article mentions just how easy it is to poach from Blizzard now because people yeah. are just they're ready to leave. And they hired this one. I didn't even realize this. They hired a former Trump administration. Uh, Activision uh, Blizzard did. Oh, Activision Blizzard did. Okay. Yeah, into the into the Activision Blizzard. Um, yeah. Ugh. Yep. I remember when that happened. I was like, blah. Yeah. Um, at least I think it was into Activision Blizzard. I didn't think it was into. It's, it, 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 yeah, it says Activision. Yeah, Blizzard. it's into that. But he still has to has to be accepted by the Activision and Blizzard side. Uh, well, he doesn't have to be accepted by it, but there might be friction there if they're not. Uh, people aren't happy with them uh, being in that role. I think, it's, is it CFO? Or something he was been financial? hired to oversee Call of Duty Endowment, a nonprofit foundation co-founded by Kodak that helps former service members in the U.S. and U.K. transition oh. to civilian careers. Okay. I, don't think, I don't know if it's CFO, though. No, no, then it isn't. Okay. Yeah, Sure. But I mean, yeah, yeah. Overall, like a really good article. Sad, it is. but this is kind of how the the game industry churns, um, yeah. especially as people age and are have enough money. They're like, "Fuck, oh, I'm gonna do something fun instead. Why waste yeah. my life doing this shit?" <laughs> I'm tired of dealing. Remember when I did this and it was fun? I want to do that again. Um, yes, exactly. Oh wait, Why I don't have the money to do that. Fuck. All right, <laughs> I'm out. I want to look forward going to work instead of whatever the fuck's happening here. Yeah, you know? it's uh. This is a good article overall. I would like to see more long form stuff. Like I feel like you usually only get this from like Schreier typically. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I really um, enjoy this. But you should get more. I am sad Polygon doesn't really do this anymore. Early Polygon mm-hmm. used to do these pretty regularly, like very long form journalist pieces, and then uh that stopped at some point. Um probably when one an editor went away. Um, but They're looking at how many clicks they get and how much engagement. Yeah, it, ownership of the websites change and the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I definitely feel like uh, I, I'm liking IGN even more and more lately. So. Oh, me too, dude. I, <laughs> the the fucking I I haven't seen the result of the the medium post where all of the editorial team said basically you need to tell us what the fuck happened. Um, yeah. Because we're not unionized, so if the corporate overlords say no, we're not going to tell you shit. Then what? then what do you do? You know? And it's so weird for me, you know, we're, we're referencing the Palestine yeah, children's they, fund yep. that IGN put up and we're raising money for. And then the, the, the brass took it down basically. Yep. Um, and it just speaks to me more and more about the power of unions because, uh, at my job, I, I've, I've spoken up repeatedly about shit that's been happening. Uh, I was one of the people leading the charge against our president because our college was being mismanaged. And the shit that I said there, I would have been fired somewhere else easily. Yeah. Um, so I just, you know, I don't know how that's going to play out. I haven't seen a follow up to their medium post, but yeah, I, I certainly, someone had said on the podcast, they're like, and I listen to a ton of IGN podcasts. Someone said the, the talent that they have there. I don't know if they know what they have at IGN because 10 of those people can walk away, create their own Patreon and it would be ragingly successful. Um, and then you wouldn't have them at IGN anymore, you know? Yeah, um, I, I would agree. Uh, I went through that list, and I'm like, uh, I've been listening to that Persona Five podcast. Mm-hmm, by, yep. uh got uh, Dornbush and uh, Marks. Yeah, Tom Marks. Mm-hmm. Tom Marks and Dornbush, and then Dornbush has another podcast he just started called What the Shep. What the Shep? That's awesome. And it's just uh, playing through Mass Effect all again um to it's just a podcast and it's like one person who has never played it before like she's never she's heard about it but has never touched any of the games um so only knows stuff about them from like meme standpoints uh, <laughs> oh shit so they just had i think this week will be the first episode they had episode zero last week but i'm like oh Dornbush puts out some good content um yeah when he took over beyond um after it was taken over after um Greg Miller left like he I think he's really good so I like it I'm enjoying his non IGN podcast like that um so uh yeah from there I'm like if this is the quality of people that they have there and then like this article from uh 
cat like they clearly have people that can do make some really good content so uh yes it would be it'd be good if they uh, took them seriously or maybe yeah, you just don't I'm, have an IGN website following... anymore <laughs> at that point. I've been following Cat Bailey for a long time. Um, she does an RPG podcast called Acts of the Blood God that's really fucking good. Oh, cool. By the way, the um, Dornbush um, Mass Effect is called Shepet, not what the Shep it. Yeah. What the Shep um, is pretty good, too. Sorry. It is cool. That's a cool name. <laughs> um, I just subscribed. Actually, um, man, mark that one down. If we ever want to write, talk about Mass Effect, we can just do What the Shep. Um, <laughs> everybody ignore what we said. Please don't take that idea. It's a great one. <laughs> Um, speaking of Mass Effect, that's a good transition into what yeah. you've been playing. I have been playing a lot of Mass Effect. Uh, <laughs> Mass Effect and Mass Effect 2 in this past week. Um, I finished Mass Effect 1 again. Is that, I think, early in the podcast. Third time I beat it. Um, with the, the first two times being quite a while ago. Um, because anytime I was replaying the trilogy, I skipped one recently. I would just... Um, on PC, there was a, there's a website where you can just download Shepard save files. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> so you can just like choose. I'm like, I want a Shepard save file that has, that did these decisions in the first game. Right. Um, cool. Download, import that into mass effect two. Let's go. Um, because I just didn't want to play mass effect <laughs> one again. Cause holy shit it was painful. Um, but I want to say it's not as painful anymore. Um, <laughs> it's really enjoyable, man. It is enjoyable. Um, this is also the first time that I've gone from Mass Effect 1 to Mass Effect 2, like, right back to back. Um, when I first played Mass Effect to Mass Effect 2, there's a three-year difference uh, between the games. Holy crap, is that, like, the jump in production quality, in design, um, in polish and visuals, insane. Um even for the remaster, you're just like, holy shit. Like, a lot happened at Bioware in three years when they got to Mass right. Effect 2. Like, they were like, okay, the first game was kind of us experimenting with us doing our own, like, space opera and how does this work and the RPGs that we've done before. Two was like, okay, let's take everything we learn and actually execute on that, like, fully realize now. And uh, just from the start, it's still probably has one of the best openings to a video game I've ever played. Um, I remember being stunned when I played it the first time. Like, wait, this is where we're starting? Yeah. And it's still like, holy shit. Um, we're, we're doing this. Um, but one ended, it, it still hit me in the right way of the last couple hours of Mass Effect 1 are just amazing. Um, I think there's good the Novaria stuff and Pharaohs have good decisions and it really shows like the power of their storytelling working. Um, but when you hit, uh, Ilos and then back, get jumped back to the Citadel and you're running towards the end game, it's just nonstop. Um, and it's, again, it starts showing the hints of what they would execute on in future titles. Um, a standout moment for me is whenever you're get back to the Citadel, uh, Sovereign is there, Saren's there, um, and you're taking the elevator up to the to the council tower, the Citadel Tower, and it stops midway, and you shoot the window of the elevator because you're gonna go out on the hull. The way mm. the camera moves from behind you and like pans up above Shepard, so now it looks like you're looking down on the hull, and then she like walks out, and the whole camera transitions now that gravity is you stuck to the running up this tower. Um, it's an amazing cinematic scene that's just like just you feel the weight of it sovereigns at the tip of the tower is just enormous as you're running towards it um it just gets you so excited for the end of that game as it's going and happening um and then it ends and you're like yeah this is amazing give me the next now let's go i'm in um and i think that's the power of the first game is that it continuously builds on itself more and more and more and more up until this just like crescendo of uh, excitement and uh, climax that happens that a lot of games don't land their endings that well. Um, And I think that just makes the, like is a nice bow tie to the whole experience that you've gone through that. It just has that initial opening at Eden, uh, Eden prime, um, Kind of builds real spike, 
comes back down and then slowly just starts ramping up the pressure as you play and play and play um, until it hits that point of just pure adrenaline. Um, and that's what else I think the, where mass effect one just shines. Um, and then yeah, two is just two and I'm well into two. I'm doing all my loyalty missions. Now I have every crew member except Legion cause you don't get Legion till later. Um, and I don't want to get Legion because I think once you get Legion, you very quickly have to get to the end of the game. Um, Legion's the one that's like cryo froze or something like that, where it's like locked into something. You have to like eventually let that person out. No, that's Grunt. That right? That's Grunt. Is that Grunt? Okay. That's Grunt. Legion wow. is the Geth that you find who's oh, wearing yeah, that's Shepherd, right, that's right, that's right. Shepherd's, wow, a piece of Shepherd's armor. Badly. So, but I think that's the next story mission that I have listed. And I told Lucid Mans, do you want to go do this? And I'm like, no, I need to build my team, actually. Um, I need, because the, the one thing that two is doing, it's like, if you just let the game run at its pace, it's going to push you through that main story before you see a ton of content. Yeah. It's just like, keeps the pressure on of like, got to go, got to go, got to go. But then I was like, no, no, pump the brakes. I gotta, I have more team members to collect. Um, I remember feeling that way as well, where you were just, and other games do it as well, where you're like, you have this, you have to keep going. It's like, I kind of want to stop and see their content, but then you feel like I'm not supposed to do this. No, and this one does. You're just like, because it does set up the premise of you need to put together a good team. But then the elusive man is just very much like, hey, we we found this derelict reaper. You need to go and get the get something from it um so you can make the suicide run and i'm like well i don't have a team ready yet to do that so i'm not gonna do that right now dude like chill we we got this um so yeah i went and collected all my party members and now i'm working through loyalty missions on on most of them uh i will get through all of them and i love the characters in mass effect 2 god i love that team they're just so many neat little stories and i will say that none of the stories are overstay their welcome in a lot of ways it's a very trimmed and very focused on the character when you're in it and just really expands on each of your team members um, in interesting ways so i've been really enjoying that and i'm playing it the first time through where i wasn't getting the dlc after i'd finished the game so i get it as it's integrated into the game and how is it integrated it's i mean they're just missions that happen they're like you get messages that say hey there's this we found this thing go go do it um i've done all the dlc missions at this point um and they're integrated just fine it's just like any other mission in the game like if i'm sure there are people that are going to come to this and going to play it and be like have no clue some of these missions were dlc right yeah I, they're just, I feel they're like just not. Unique. They're just gonna be. They're just gonna be there, and you'll be like, um, and there was one that I did that I was only after about a half an hour doing this mission that I was like, I think this was DLC. I think I remember playing this as DLC, but I didn't know for sure. Um, it was the I'd looked up after it was DLC, and I'm like, I'm sure I played it, but I had forgotten it. Um, overall, I don't know if that's a good sign about that DLC, but. <laughs> It was still a fine DLC, but it was just like, oh, okay. So there's a they just get integrated like that, where they're just part of the game. Um, I assume that's how they would have shown up if I went, ever went back and played, uh, had played through ME2 with it all installed all at once. Um, so that was great, though. I think I've played all the major ones now. Overlord, Arrival, and Shadow Broker. Um, and Shadow Broker is still really good. Like, holy I crap. Can't wait to get um, I cannot wait. It's so good. Um, that's kind of like what I want from the fucking trilogy here is to play that. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, Overlord was actually, uh, was really cool. And like, it's a, I don't think I gave it enough credit when I played it after everything, but just playing it integrated is just playing through it. Uh, it's a kind of just a standalone little story that's going on and you work through it, but the production quality on it is insane. There's like so many quirky, cool little things that they do in that DLC and like use of, I don't know, designs and rendering and all sorts of cool things that it's like, Oh, the production quality was like 
top notch for this one. Um, so that one, that one's been fun. I don't know. I'm excited. I two is great. Two is still one of the best games I've ever played. Yeah, um, I'm looking. It so takes to it. everything that one did and does more of it. It does the things that one did better and jettisons the stuff that is like just throws away the stuff that's like, nah, this doesn't, this isn't what we want to be doing with this series. Um, I think the only nitpick, and I can kind of see where people talk about it, is that it does strip the RPG elements, yeah. like stat crunch back, but it doesn't strip it back from the conversations. So it's an interesting right. thing of being like, well, you still do a lot of talking, and there's a lot of choice to your words and what you do, but let's just remove a bunch of these like uh, list of stats that you get for things. Like right. trim it back gotta- quite a bit. I got to say that I much more enjoy the conversation RPG part than the stats RPG part. So yeah. I was not unhappy about that. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm completely OK with it because it gets to what the game was trying to be, which is a a choice based action game. Right. As opposed to a RPG action game or shoot it. It's more shooter in two than RPG. Yep. Uh, stat wise and that's bet i think the game's better for it like i, I think th- if three overall had like i felt like the story ended fine i think three actually found probably the best between the two for like adding just a bit more depth to the to the crunch side of it the stats mm-hmm. but not going too far than two two did but never being back to one um yeah because it just gave you a little bit more freedom and like your weapon loadouts in three because you had like a weight depending on your class like you could carry so you could kind of like mix and match your weapons a little bit um and how you modified the weapons was a was a little bit more to build out certain i would say builds it gave you a slight ability to do builds where two doesn't have builds really it's just you have abilities go (laughs) Yeah, something that's, um, I guess one of the things I'm finding that I don't like about one is like putting all the different modifications into your armor. Oh, and God. Guns and shit. <laughs> and I'm just like, all right, it's a, okay, it's plus whatever. It's like, okay, this, just give me a gun that works. Uh-huh. Um, and I think that's just very holdover from the RPGs that they had done before. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. And they, they were, Mass Effect was very built on the fact that they had done D&D based games before right. it. Um, I guess the only one they did Jade Empire as well. Um, before, that wasn't which stats was heavy, was it? Huh? That wasn't stats heavy, was it? I don't remember. I never played it. <laughs> uh, Bill is listening and laughing because we were just talking about Jade Empire. Um, I, I mean, I have the special edition. I played some of it. Nathan Fillion voices a character in it. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Uh, it is kind of cool, but it also, when trying to play it now, you're just like, it's a bunch of like... Canadian white dudes doing Asian influenced like craziness and yep I don't it's not awful but you're like this could be better in a lot of yeah, ways when I looked at it, I was like oh okay that I could see that this could be potentially problematic <laughs> yes and I haven't played it enough to see like oh is it super problematic I'm like I don't know but it's definitely one of those things where it's like hmm I played, I think I played like a few hours of it back in the day and it was, it was fine. It was their first foray in trying a little bit of action RPG going on, but it still held itself to that very never went Baldur's Gate, never winter nights, old Republic style party gameplay kind of stuff. And Mass Effect does the first Mass Effect does as well to a point. It's only two where they really shed that and being like, no, we're not doing that. We are making a shooter with RPG elements um, in conversation trees. We are not making your uh, space D and D game anymore. Um, yeah, I think I, I think I will point out that if my friend Bill is playing through it and enjoying it, it's not as problematic as we fear. I think he would put it down otherwise. Yeah, um, but I, I, I think so. One, one of the things. Of oh, we're actually talking about. Problematic I think the one stuff that ties the Mass Effect trilogy together, just to wrap up that point you're making yeah. earlier, is that each has something different in that vein. Yes. So, and everyone gets something different from those three. That it kind of fits together nicely as a trilogy, where some one person might want that crunchiness in all three, but they only get it in one. So they enjoy one, 
And then the characters, of course, and that whole conversation thing carries out through three. So you're getting different people are getting different things that they really like about each of these games. And it just kind of all ties together nicely. That's it does different in that way. Um, so uh, the problematic stuff, cause I think, uh, your friend Bill was talking about, uh, persona four some. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I decided I'm like, you know what? I actually just don't want to spend a hundred hours playing a persona game. I'm just going to watch the anime that they made of it. <laughs> oh shit. Okay. <laughs> and so I watch it. Holy shit. Does that get problematic? Like, oh, okay. I thought it was, like, tame at something. Like, I'm like, okay, this isn't great. I'm just like, there are parts where I'm just like, what the fuck? Like, there, t- I don't even want to get into it, but I'm just like, oh, holy shit, never mind. This, uh, there are parts that I'm just like, this is super cringe. Um, well, it's, like, homophobic in, in some parts, isn't it? Uh, that's the stuff I got to at the beginning that was like, yeah, this isn't great. I look at the year that it's made, I'm like, this isn't good. I understand the jokes being made here. I can move past this. Like, not cool. There's some trans stuff later that's not handled yeah. well at all. Yeah. Right. Like that you're just like, what the fuck? Um, I, I don't see how this could be interpreted as good at all. Right. Not even um, be like, well, it's just a relic of the time. It's like just way worse than that. It is a relic of the time, but to a point where I'm just like, I can't even deal with this. Sort yeah, of thing. Exactly. Like, yeah, I get this is a, how at that time there was probably talk and thoughts in this, but it's actually just very harmful. That's not good. We should probably not talk about this and move right. on. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it got worse. Um, I just finished the story with anime, though. So there you go. Um, well, I'm glad you didn't invest 100 hours into I was like, I, I like, I want to see what happens and I like the characters, but I really just don't want to deal with the very boring dungeons in that game. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I will say that I don't, I feel like Mass Effect doesn't have nearly those problematic elements. <laughs> no, <laughs> it really, it really either steers clear of that, like intentionally or just like that just wasn't, you know, yeah. I, the, I think what was, what, what they did steer clear from was the ability to have same sex relationships early on. They did. And they opened that up as the series went on. Exactly. Right. Because they even got a lot. I remember the original mass effect getting a bunch of like national news coverage for the fact that it lets you romance that female alien, same sex. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're like, well, it's in the, yeah. Um, and is that really a same sex relationship? They're sorry. Um, and as the second game has reminded me in a side little conversation you can have in a bar somewhere where a group of co- co-workers is having a bachelor party uh, to an Asari dancer um, around them being like, and they're all different races being like, well, the Asari are attractive to Solarians because they look like Solarians. Uh, what do you mean they look like Solarians? They look like Turians. You can tell by the like head frills and the, and the humans like, what do you mean? They, they, they just look like humans with this, their uh little tendrils on their head and then they're like wait what if the asari are mind controlling all of us so that we're they're attractive <laughs> to each race differently <laughs> and i'm like that's mentioned one time in the game and i think it's just a running meme now being like that's actually possible yeah you may not actually know what an asari looks like right that they look like whatever is attractive to the uh species they are uh talking to well, that's, that's it's just that's, a, that's the thing about mass effect 2 there's tons of these little tiny side conversations that you either can initiate or they just happen in passing right if you just stand around you just hear these conversations going on and some of them are incredible um uh blasto the hanar assassin um movie trailer thing that gets keeps playing uh oh, on yeah. Illum. Mm-hmm. And there's like a whole storyline. You hear news things of being like, you hear the trailer happening for uh, for it. And then you later you can come through and you hear like a news thing talking about the Hanar Defamation League is speaking out against this awful movie. <laughs> uh, uh, totally misrepresenting the Hanar people. Um, what else was there? Uh, Elcor Hamlet on the Citadel. At some point you can look in advertisement. And they're like. God, I don't remember that at all. Oh my God, it gets me every time. <laughs> That's so cool. I just like, uh, I'm just on my desk just laughing every time. It's just an Elcor reciting Hamlet. <laughs> I'm so glad this game 
has hit now and yeah. it's hit so well. I've been so good this week. <laughs> I only played one night for an hour. Otherwise, I've been working. Um, but it's, I know obviously it's better anyways, but Mass Effect 1 is much better than I remember um, in a lot of ways, the writing specifically. Yeah. Um, and the world building that's offloaded just marvelously offloaded to the codex. So there's not just info dump after info dump, which is what I fucking hate about sci-fi so much. Um, they don't do it. And that's why I think I've been having the conversation forever with Brad about, I just, I don't really like sci-fi, but for some reason I fucking love mass effect. And I feel like this time I finally have got why they don't yeah. info dump. You just, you're put right into like Shep's already in a career and we're already moving forward with something, and it's just you're, you're you're moving forward immediately. You're just you're you just jump into a swiftly moving river, and they don't take time to explain stuff besides the basics. And then you pick stuff up as you go, and you just yeah. keep accumulating knowledge as you go. And it just it feels such a lived in world. Um, Would you say that I'm, you're more willing to deal with info dumps and fantasy, just in general? No, I fucking hate info hate dumps info anywhere. Um, okay. I just feel like I've perhaps read the wrong sci fi. Um, Possibly. I mean, to... you read Levi- Leviathan Wakes, didn't you? And I loved it. it yeah, yeah, it doesn't info dump. It's just you're in this universe. Enjoy. Like, yep, that's why you're, I fo- like you're it. following characters that are just living in the universe. They don't explain the universe to you. Um, right. Uh-huh. And that, I love it. Um, but, but there, you know, there's fantasy that does info dump. I'm trying to think of a name right now of a, a fantasy novel that um, there's one. That, OK, uh, shit. The guy who wrote for Destiny, he. Uh, the trader Baru Cormorant does not info dump. It's just you're okay. in the world. You're expected to fucking get it as you go. And it's like one of the best books I've read in the past five years. Um, I'm just attracted to that kind of writing. And Mass Effect 1 does that so well. And then Mass Effect 2 takes that to another level, like where you start in Mass Effect 2, right? Yeah. Um, it just it does it again. Like it's it's uh, it's amazing. Um yeah, yeah. I, I just I'm I'm in love with it, but I only played an hour because I've I got one more week of school. I'm just trying to keep it low key, um, and not get too. I, I just want to dive in so badly, but I'm being like an adult, which is weird. Um, being very responsible with my time, um, but I also played this week two other things. One, I want to just tell you, if you go back to different podcasts throughout our our run, many times I've mentioned how much I'm looking forward to playing Mario Sunshine one day because it's the one Mario game I really haven't played. Sure, I fucking hate it i hate that game <laughs> so much I, every time i play it i i literally bend my controller until it creaks the controls the camera the camera the camera on that game is the worst camera in any game i've ever played i fucking hate it badly like there's just like normal mario shit that i can't do because the camera sucks and my daughter is just sitting there staring at me like, Daddy, why can't you get that coin? I'm like, I'm going to break this controller into dust. <laughs> I don't know. Why can't I get this coin? <laughs> <laughs> I don't suck at video games. I promise you, this game sucks. I hate it. My daughter loves it. So that's where we're at. <laughs> um, and the other thing I played is something I'm doing new. Um, I'm trying to spend 20 minutes sometime during the week with a game I haven't played before that I own. So I loaded up Aztec. I don't know if you remember Aztec. Yeah, I know Aztec. Aztec. Yeah. The black and white, basically, yeah, brawler kind yeah. of thing. So I, I, I played that this weekend for 20 minutes. I actually probably played for like 30 minutes because I got into it. Um, but it's not what I thought it was. I thought it was a side-scrolling beat-em-up. It's not. It's uh, kind of like a tile-based, um, think of like a civilization or something like that, where you like overtake cities near you during your turn and the way to overtake the city is you go to the city and then you get dropped into an arena where it is side scrolling beat em up, but you're just in an arena where you it's you and like six enemies or 10 enemies right. or whatever. And you beat those enemies then you're done. And then you collect resources and then you can unlock new cities and expand your empire. Um, it's got really deep uh, battle mechanics that are almost exactly like super smash brothers. So okay. if you like super smash brothers, like this, the, the fighting is for you. Um, and I really enjoyed it. It was really interesting, but I don't really like the city expanding. But it's a, but it's a strategy game. Yeah, it's a strategy game. I do like, remember this, like and all strategy. the trailers showed the the combat, mm-hmm. not and the strategy part. I didn't know that at all. I was like, okay, it's just going to be like a level-based you know, beat-em-up, go through, yeah. beat shit up. Nah, that's not what it is. And the battling stuff is fun, but the other stuff is like, I don't... I, just clicking through because I don't care about this. 
Um, <laughs> so it was definitely like whiplash. Like, wait, what? What is this game? So uh, that's what I've been playing this week, and that's about it. Probably okay. put in, I put in a total of like one, two, three hours into games this week. <laughs> oh boy! But Unlike yes, you, your I school's you almost done today. <laughs> Yes, um, I think I was especially, basically would work would end on, ended on Thursday and Friday. I made myself some dinner. I didn't cheap out on my dinner. I actually like cooked a nice dinner for myself. Um, but then I was playing basically from like seven to midnight, Friday, Thursday, Friday, and then probably like 12 hours on Saturday. Oh my God, I want that. I want that so badly <laughs> I was for myself. Thanks so much. <laughs> um, to a point where my actual thumb was hurting. Oh shit! <laughs> like I actually like my thumb joint is achy from pressing the the button so much. Um, oh my! Uh, yeah, kind of awesome. Kind of like fuck, I'm old. Sort of feeling <laughs> like that. Can I not do this anymore? Am I actually like screwing up my hands? Um, mm-hmm. So that's a cool feeling. Uh, I am looking forward to this week. I think the next Monster Hunter Rise patch hits the 26th. They have a... If it follows the same way they did the last one, they're doing a video event, like, uh, Wednesday morning on the 26th at 7 a.m., and if it follows how the last patch worked, that means at 5 p.m. that day, the new the update will be out. Right. So you're Which will actually have that. the end of the game, finally. So you'll finish Mass Effect 2 and then drop back into Monster Hunter. For a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so... Uh, I'm... St- yeah, I think the next few weeks, though, on this uh, podcast will just be me talking about Mass Effect stuff. Because uh, I'm still still going all in. We're going to finish oh, this man. trilogy all in one go. Starting not the next podcast, but the podcast after that, I will be joining you because I'll be yeah. unleashed. <laughs> Let's do it. Um, oh, I can't fucking wait. It's so good, man. I'm just like, I got to stop. I got to go to bed. I can't. Oh, yeah. Do actually, this. The, the the only problematic element that I've that I've seen, it, it's one and two a bit, is it has an issue with, I would say, male gaze at times. Oh, for sure. The, you there's fucking certain dress within the first two hours. Yeah, um, and then there's definitely like costumes that are chosen. You're just like, really? We're doing okay, okay. Um, Samara being one of them, right? Um, just like, whoa, okay, I forgot about this. Um, uh, so it has a bit of that. Um, so although I'm like, yeah, that's just to me that feels I'm like less of a a issue of like I'll stop playing this because we're just being like, yep. That's a thing. Okay, moving on. Let's. Uh, yeah, it's always probably a question, why like, not my wife will play it for my wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should probably be like seriously. Um, yeah, I think of all the games I played in for my wife, she was the most intrigued by Lost Lake, uh, Uncharted Lost Legacy. Legacy. She was like, there are female leads in this game, they're badasses." Like, yep. <laughs> yeah. I should show you Mass Effect, but then I'm like, "Oh well." Mm. <laughs> well, the lead is pretty badass, um, and a lot of the ki- your your crewmates are really badass uh yep. strong female badass but there's just some questionable uh uh outfit choices um i do like there's a point in mass effect 2 where someone calls out miranda <laughs> oh yeah mm-hmm. for dressing this like some cerberus whore <laughs> like do you dress yourself that way or does cerberus <laughs> make you do that <laughs> um and you're just like whoa okay um but it was a nice uh to me, in-game nod of being like, yes, we are aware of this. Yeah, um, right. So, I don't know. I enjoy the games quite a bit. We'll talk more next week about uh, probably me finishing Mass Effect 2 and Into 3. Oh, yeah. that's. I'm sure that's... I would be shocked if we uh, don't do that next week. <laughs> um, and we'll. Be, I'm sure once Friday's done, just like I'm going to dive in on Saturday and just be Dang. super stoked to talk about it. So... Uh, well, this was episode 292, I believe, if I have that right, um, of Prof and Dev Play Games. It is our palindrome podcast. Um, thanks for being with us. If you like our episode please, uh, podcast, please tell your friends, rate us on your podcast service of choice, and we will be back next week with more of uh, What the Shep, yeah. <laughs> which is what our podcast is turning into. In fact, you have to name it that. <laughs> you have to name the I will. I will name it What the, the Shep. Yeah. Cool. All right, folks. We'll see you soon. All right. Later, everyone.